invite you to, with us, just approach the throne of God this morning. Just leave everything behind and worship God with all of your heart. Sing and may our voices pierce through the heavens and reach the throne of God this morning. Our first song is I Love to Tell the Story. Let's sing together. from your heart. I love to tell the story to be my theme in glory to tell the old story of Jesus and to tell to tell the story that we will tell in heaven about Christ. Our hope is found in Christ, in Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, his cornerstone, this solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. Every voice. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. And as he stands. In victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am His and He is mine. But with the precious blood of Christ, for I am His, for I am His and He is mine. But with the precious blood of Christ. I invite you guys to stand with us as we sing our theme song and really think about what it means to say that Christ will reign in us. Ponder upon that thought as you sing this song. sing together. You thought of us before the world began to breathe, and you knew our names before we came to be. You saw the very day we fall away from you, how desperately we Lord Jesus, come lead us, we're desperate for your touch. Oh, great and mighty one, oh, great and mighty one, with one 
Your perfect love. We need your perfect love. We need your, your discipline. discipline. We're lost unless you guide us with your light. Lord Jesus, come lead us. We're desperate for your touch. Great and mighty one. Oh, great and mighty one, with one desire we come, that you would reign, that you would reign in us. We're offering up our lives, a living sacrifice, that you would reign, that you Voices, oh great, oh great and mighty one, with one desire we come that you would reign, that you would reign in us. For we'll offer our lives, bring up our lives, a living sacrifice. Dear God, it is our desire that you would reign in us. And not just in us, but in our Southwestern family, in the lives of our friends, and in the lives of our families at home. And right now we just wanna take a moment to silently lift up those requests that we have for our families to you. Dear God, you've heard all of the requests and the things that are on our heart, and you know all of the things that maybe we didn't even get a chance to say right now. But we just ask that you would come into this place and that you would reign in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, Southwestern. Okay, wait a minute. I know it's 10.45 in the morning, and I know some of y'all don't want to be here, but I'm going to do this one more time. Good morning, Southwestern. Good morning, brother. Amen. <laughs> um, first, I want to thank RV and his team for just bringing us into worship this morning. And um, before I open my scripture, and I just want to say one thing. If any pastor or anybody comes up here and say they're not nervous, they are lying. Don't believe them, because I am nervous as nervous could be possibly get right now. But I know that God has given a message this morning that we are going to receive this morning. So um, before we pray, can we open up our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 6? Proverbs chapter 6. And this is um, the verse that Hannah read yesterday. Hannah, um, Hannah read it yesterday. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. And it reads, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension among brothers. My title this morning is The Most Likely to Succeed. And I'll be talking about the feet that are quick to rush into evil. But before I talk about that, let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord, I'm a broken vessel. I'm not worthy to be up here, Lord, but you've called me to be here this morning. You've called all of us to be here, Lord, because we want to break the cycle that is hindering us from being closer to you. We want your touch, we want your love. So let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, amen. All right, so it was 2007, my eighth grade year. I graduated, everything was going great. And yearbooks came out. And normally in yearbooks they have like best dress, blah, 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 and so they said, we're going to have um, eighth grade super superlatives. And so I was chosen as the person that would go to win American Idol. That was my superlative. Did I believe that at the time? Oh, yes, I did. Did I try? Oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> so um, when you think of superlative, it, the definition means of the highest quality or degree or an exaggerated or hyperbolical expression of praise. And I have some crazy super superlatives here that I'm going to read off for you. Um, one that says, most likely to go home, off of Survivor. Now, Survivor is a cool show. I mean, all of us have seen Survivor before. Now, for someone to tell you that you're the most likely to go home off of Survivor, I don't think that's good in any way, shape, or form. There's one that says, most likely to go to prison. I don't know who wants most likely to go to prison, but if you get that, I feel really bad for you. <laughs> most likely to win a game show. Now this one, I know some people in here will be very upset if they got this. Worst dressed. Now there's best dressed, but if you get worst dressed, that's a problem. That is an issue in and of itself. And there's one that says most likely to win a spelling bee, but this one is my favorite one. Most likely to drop out of their major, return to their major, drop out of their major again, and then go back to their major, and then graduate. Now, some people in here, I'm not gonna call anybody out, you know who you are. Some of you have changed your majors four, five, six times, but you're graduating. Some of y'all graduated in 2014, amen? So, you made it. So, um, so, I'm gonna talk about the most hated man in the Bible, and how most, if not all of us in this room, are like him today. The person I'm talking about is Judas. Now, some of y'all are like, oh, I know the Judas story already. He betrayed Jesus, you know, and I'm definitely not like him. But when you really go into Judas's life, you realize how much each one of us have a piece of Judas in our lives. And I'm going off of Desire of Ages chapter 76, which I really encourage you guys during your spare time to go and read that chapter because that chapter enlightened me on the story of Judas, things that I never knew before. Now, in Desire of Ages chapter 76, it, talks, it starts talking about how Judas was the top disciple. He was the disciple that all of the disciples looked up to. Actually, Judas was the one that the disciples chose 
Jesus really didn't choose Judas. The disciples did. They said, this guy is so good. He is, he's just a perfect guy. And he was. He would have been the one that was chosen as the great one. He had many skills, and he had the power to cast out devils in his name, in Jesus' name. Jesus gave him that right. But his power and his fame took over him, and he started taking it to his head. I know a lot of us here, a lot of us are involved in different things. And sometimes, even though Keene is very small, it's not Dallas, it's not Atlanta, this is Keene. You know, it's not a big place, but sometimes power and the fame and, oh, you can sing really good, or, oh, you can play this instrument really good, or you can do well in this subject. Sometimes it gets to our head. And in this part of the story, it got to Judas's head. My main point for my, I have two main points this morning. My first main point is that he wanted to be with Christ, but he did not want to be molded in Christ's image. Genesis chapter 1 talks about how let us make man in our image after our likeness. He wanted the title of being a Christian, but he never wanted the way, the, the, he never, he wanted the title of being a Christian, but he never wanted the steps to be one. He basically wanted to have the title, sit here and be like, yes, I'm a Christian. Everyone's going to love me and support me, but he never wanted to do the things that needed to be a true Christian. Turn your Bibles to, um, to John 13, verse 30. John chapter 13, verse 30. We're going to talk about light for a minute. We, tell, um, we sang it in our theme song this morning. We're going to talk about light. John chapter 13, verse 30. And it says, As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. Now, darkness and light can't come together. As matter how hard you try, darkness and light cannot coexist. In Desire of Ages, chapter 76, it talks about how Judas had every opportunity to come back to Christ. And when he dipped that bread at the Last Supper and he went out into night, that was his final destination. He had no return of coming back into the light. Now, um, I remember a couple of um, weeks ago, Chaplain Matei came up here and did a Vespers. And she used this example, and I'm going to use it today. Sometimes we wake up in the morning, and we put on our clothes and everything, and we think we look great. We think that we're just all of that in a bag of chips. And we walk outside, and we realize that there's a stain on our clothes that we didn't see in our room. And we're like, oh my goodness, there's a stain on my clothes. And it's not one of those small stains where, like, Tide to Go can get it out. It's a big, huge stain. And you didn't realize it. So you're going to rush back to the dorm and change and you want, to put on, you want to find new clothes, maybe it would have been better for you to turn on the light in your room so that you could see exactly what you were putting on before you stepped outside. A lot of people these days, especially with Judas's case, he thought he was all that, and he thought that he was the one that was going to carry Jesus to be the king of Jerusalem, but he never realized the stains that were in his character. God God realized that there were stains in Judas's character, just as all of the other disciples. And he gave him a job as a disciple, as a treasurer. And it says in chapter 76, actually it says on um, page 717 of Desire of Ages, that Judas was highly regarded by the disciples and had great influence over them. He himself had a high opinion of his own qualifications and looked upon his brethren as greatly inferior to him in judgment and ability. Sometimes we, as Christians, we look upon others as, oh, why, why are they in church? They have on, they have on, they have tattoos. They're not wearing the correct clothes. They're not talking the correct language. And we look upon them with judgment and we say, oh, they can't come up front and speak. I'll tell you today that I don't feel like I should deserve to be here this morning. I feel, I know a lot of people think, oh, yes, Robert's going to preach today and he's going to give the word. I don't feel that way. I have stains in my character just as every one of you here in this room. But God has given me the ability to come up here and speak this morning. In page 717, it also says that Judas saw the sick, the lame, and the blind, and he flocked to Jesus from the towns and the cities. He saw the dying laid at his feet. He witnessed the Savior's mighty works in healing the sick, casting out devils, and raising the dead. He felt in his own person the evidence of Christ's power, he recognized the teaching of Christ as superior to all that he had ever heard. He loved the great teacher, and he desired to be with him. He felt a desire to be changed in character and life, 
and he hoped to experience this through connecting himself with Jesus. Jesus trusted him to do the work of an evangelist. He endowed him with the power to heal the sick and cast out the devils. But Judas did not come to the point of surrendering himself fully to Christ. He did not give up his worldly ambition nor his love of money. While he accepted the position of the minister of Christ, he did not bring himself under the divine molding. He felt like he could retain his own judgment and opinions, and he cultivated a disposition to criticize and accuse. He didn't surrender himself fully to Christ. When we come into the lightness of Christ and we come into his light, if we don't surrender fully to Christ and leave the worldly ambitions, this is not our home. Christ has a home waiting for us in heaven someday, and I know that I want to be there. I don't want to stay here anymore. This world has nothing for me, but a lot of us, including myself, we see all of these worldly attractions and all of these things that draw us into this world, and we sometimes forget that we have to fully surrender to Christ in order for Christ to use us. Let's move on to John chapter 1, verse 4. John chapter 1 and verse 4. In John chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So we see here that in this context that Jesus, he was the light, and the disciples were around him. But Judas, he wasn't willing to be in that light. He still had his hand over in darkness. As Pastor Sorky did in our Life and Teachings of Jesus quiz today, no one can serve two masters. Either you can serve God or you can serve Satan. The choice is yours. I have an illustration this morning, and it's going to be pretty embarrassing on my account. I was six years old. I was in kindergarten. Great time of my life. And in kindergarten, we always have nap time. And so I never liked to sleep in nap time. Never in my life did I like to sleep. And so I had to use the bathroom really bad, super bad. And my teacher, I kept asking my teacher, I said, can I go use the bathroom? And she was like, no, you can't. And I was like, is this lady done lost her mind? I'm telling you, I got to use the bathroom. And like, I had, I had new clothes on. My mom had bought me new clothes, and I was, just, I was trying to impress this girl. And so I had these new clothes on, and I was going in there, and I was like, yes, 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 this is going to be good. And I was like, if I pee on my clothes, this girl not going to like me. So I was like, this teacher need to understand. So I go up to her desk, and I'm like, I have to use the bathroom. You don't understand. She's like, you can hold it. You need to wait. And I was like, this lady done lost her mind. I don't know what's going on. And so nap time came, and normally during nap time, the teacher's assistant would stay in the room, and the other teacher would go and take care of some other things around the daycare center. And so the teacher's assistant was on her phone and whatnot, and all of us were supposed to be sleeping. But me, I was squirming all over my mat because I need to use the bathroom. And so I said, okay, I'm just going to get up, and I'm going to go use the bathroom, and I'm going to come back, and no one's going to know. So the teacher's aide is sitting there. She's not really looking at anything. So thank goodness my mat was closest to the door. So I got up from my mat, and I ran to the bathroom, opened the door. The bathroom was dark, mind you. So I didn't know where anything was. But I was like, it's going to take too long to turn this light on, and I'm going to pee on myself, so I need to use the bathroom right now. So I'm going to the bathroom, and I close the door, and I'm like, OK, I'm going I'm to use the bathroom. So I use the bathroom, and I realized it was dark. And I was like, where's the door? So I start feeling all over the walls, and I'm just like, Where, where's the door? What have I done? I need to get out of here. And so I start having a nervous breakdown. I start crying and whatnot. And to make a long story short, I slipped because I missed the toilet. And I slipped, and I fell. And the place that I fell, all of my clothes got messed up. So, did I use the bathroom? Yes, I did. Did I mess my clothes up? I guess I did. And did that girl ever talk to me again for the next year? She did not. So, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a really, really sad time. And um, if you ever, when I ever cut my hair, there's a nick in the back of my head. And um, the nick in the back of my head is because I slipped and I busted my head open. And so I always have this nick right here. My mom always reminds me. She said, you remember that nick in the back of your head, boy? You have to, you have to listen. You have to listen. So I always have that reminder there. Now, that story, of course, was embarrassing on all of my account. But the reason why I told that story is because one of the main reasons why I slipped and fell is because, first of all, I didn't obey my teacher. My teacher told me, stay right here. Don't go to the bathroom. I was, she was more than likely going to take me after nap time. And I could have holded it. 
But at six years old, who thinks that they're gonna hold their own, who thinks they're gonna hold in weights for the bathroom, you know? Um, and the other thing is that the room was dark. There was no light. So I didn't know where I was going. That's the same thing in our Christian walk. Jesus has given us his light to illumine our path through life. We can either accept it or we can't. We can walk through darkness and we can slip up and we can fall, but Jesus will always be right there to turn on that light and he will always illumine our path. We, all we have to do is surrender totally to him. My main point number two is that he liked the on, Judas liked the honor of being with Jesus and saw the advantage of being his disciple. He wanted to have the title but not take the job description. Let's go to Matthew chapter 23, verses 25 through 28. Matthew chapter 23, verses 25 through 28. And Hannah read this text yesterday. It says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe unto you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. They, they always say you should walk the walk and talk the talk. A lot of us will talk the talk but not walk the walk. A lot of us will claim that we're Christians and we'll come up here and we'll say that everything is okay and we'll sing our song, O great and mighty one, with one desire we come, that you will reign, that you will reign in us. But how can God reign in us when we are unclean? God cannot reign in us, and God cannot fully invest in us if we are still holding on to the dirt in our lives. They always say the man that cherishes one sin is evil. You know, I always think of the time when I was going to, when I was coming here to Southwestern. And I was in high school, I graduated and whatnot, and I went to, I said that I was gonna go to Adventist school, and that's what I wanted to do. But there was this girl at the time that went to my church, and she was going to community college, and then she was gonna go to Adventist school. And so I decided with myself, since I wasn't gonna be a theology major at the time, I was gonna be a business major. And it was cheaper anyway, so I basically, bought my mom tooth and nail to go to community college. I told her this is where I want to go, this is what I want to do, you can't force me, I want to do this, this is where I want to be. So guess what my mom did? She sent me. During that year, I failed all of my classes. Not one class did I pass that first year. I also got, um, I also was driving to school and I was speeding. I forgot that I did not pay a ticket on time. I went, I got, they arrested me and they took me to jail because I forgot to pay the ticket. And so, with that being said, I was on six months of probation. So, with me failing all of my classes and me not being able to drive to school, guess who didn't get to like the girl that time? Me. So, um, basically with all of that, going to community college, I got into things that I wasn't supposed to get into. And I did things that I wasn't supposed to. But I was like, oh, you know what, it's okay. Jesus isn't coming right now. So I'm gonna be okay, I can do what I wanna do, party, turn up, and I'm gonna be okay, because Jesus ain't coming right now. But I didn't realize that I was driving myself to my own destruction. And my mom kind of reminded me of Jesus in that sense, because Jesus is not gonna force any one of us to follow him. Jesus will allow you to make your own mistakes. That's his power of choice. And when I think about it, when I think about it, I realized what a bad of mistake I made. And it was hard for me to get here to Southwestern, but I'm here. And I realized that God brought me here for a reason. Passing all of my classes, God is good, I have great friends here, and I feel like that this is my home. And that would not have had, and to be honest, I realized that I had to go through that experience because this would have not been my home if I was forced to be here. I know some of you in here feel like you're forced to be here. Your parents are saying, you need to be at a Venice school. You're not going to go to community college. This is where your money's going to. 
Some of you guys feel forced to be here, and I'm letting you know that you have the best force in the world. This school right here will change your life. It changed my life for the better, and it made me realize that theology is where I need to be. And so I thank God for that. Now let's move on really quickly. So everyone knows Judas and the infamous kiss, where he kissed Jesus and they all took him away. I never realized until I read in chapter 76 the reason why Judas went that way. Basically, in chapter 76 of Desire of Ages, Judas wanted to help Jesus because he thought that Jesus came to this earth to be the earthly king, not the heavenly king. So he decided that he wanted to help Jesus speed this process up because Jesus was not taking anything that he was doing for his own gain. And he was wondering, he was like, why are you not taking it for any of your own gain? I'm going to help you so that you can become king of Jerusalem so that I can sit next to you on your throne. So what Judas did, which in chapter 76 it really points this out, is that Judas devised a plan. He devised a plan to betray Jesus. But that was not the only thing. That's what we think we, that was the only thing. He betrayed Jesus because he thought, that Judah, he thought that Jesus, when he got to Pilate and all of these people, that he would have been the one to reveal himself. And everyone would have bowed down in front of Jesus and worshiped Jesus, and Jesus would automatically become king of Jerusalem. But according to the story, that didn't happen. It also says that Judas cried in front of Jesus while he was getting while he was getting arrested, he cried and he said, Lord, I betrayed you. I'm sorry. I thought that you were, I thought that you were going to do this. That I tr- I'm trying to help you, Jesus, please. And Jesus did not even take a look at him. A lot of us want to rush Jesus. A lot of us want to say, Jesus, I'm going to help you help myself. When Jesus already knows how to help ourselves perfectly fine. I always say, when when will we realize that we can't tell God how to be God in our lives like it's Burger King where you can have it your way? Basically, we can't go tell God, oh, yes, this this is how I want it. God himself knows the plan for our lives, and he knows the direction that he wants us to go. But if we don't trust him and if we don't surrender completely to him, it's all for a loss. When the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, he shines his light through us. But his light cannot shine through us if, we, if he can't expose our dirt as well. God wants to help us get rid of the dirt in our lives, but some of us want our cake and we want to eat it too. We want the prestige and God to be the cosign on the agreement of life rather than the sign. Now, the question is, we've talked about Judas and how bad he was and whatnot, but some of us are wondering, how can, we, how can we allow God in our lives and clean up this dirt? Now, some of these verses you should already know, and I'm going to turn to them really quickly. Philippians 4, verses 8 through 10. Philippians 4, verses 8 through 10. And it says, Finally, brothers, whatsoever is true, whatsoever is noble, whatsoever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think, ab- think about such things. Whatever you, ha- whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, that verse has been heard so many times, and I was like, yeah, you know, we think on these things, whatsoever is good. The mind cannot think of something good and something bad at the same time. Either it can have something good in its mind or it can have something bad. A lot of us want to have the noble and the true and the, and the peace of mind that Jesus wants us to have, but we're still thinking about evil thoughts and evil things. Now, we're born into a world of sin, but Jesus wants us all to be with him. Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14 says, Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining to what is ahead, and to press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God had called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. We have to press toward the prize. Our prize is not this home. This is not our home. Heaven is our goal, and we have to press toward the mark that God has set before us. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2 and verse 21 
Romans chapter 12 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Um, and verse 21 says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We can either choose two things here this morning. We can choose the evil route. We can, and the evil route a lot of us think is just being just bad all the time, but no, that's not the case. We can choose to follow God and also dabble in Satan's mess. Or we can choose to have Christ in our heart and to live holy and surrender unto him. So my question is to you, are you going to walk the walk and talk the talk? Or are you just going to talk the talk? Let us pray. Dear Lord, we want to walk the walk and talk the talk with you. We want to be holy and acceptable to your name, dear Lord. And we know, Lord, that it's hard, Lord. We know that it's a journey, but we are willing to accept your will for our lives. Help us, Lord, not to come in place of you. Help us, Lord, that we'll be able to lead, have you lead us to our destination. Forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness, dear Lord. And help us, Lord, that every day we can become more like you. All these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.